Just like talking about your menstrual cycle during training, I feel like as soon as people get pregnant, it's like you can't do this and you can't do that and all of a sudden you're fragile. And that is sort of like strikes a chord in me of like the first thing I say to women because people reach out to me on, my, on the DM and they're like, can we just talk about what I should be doing? And I'm like, there's so much you can do. Let's not talk about what you can't do. Let's talk about all the things you can do and you can actually start doing things as long as you're not gonna start training for a marathon you never ran before. Like I'm not talking about that. <laughs> yeah, That's a horrible idea. Not, you, don't yeah, that. we don't recommend that. But you're certainly not fragile. What makes you fragile is sitting all day long and not moving, right? And that happened before you got pregnant. <laughs>
the only piece of equipment that you can get both the strength and the conditioning in. I love that. And what you mean by that is the obviously the lifting of the, the kettlebell, which is what a big chunk of. Yeah, it's a big chunk of iron. <laughs> it literally <laughs> looks a like a ball. Yeah. And then it has a little handle. Um, and it started as a training method developed by the Russian military for military and police. So it became something that people could get strong with. They could do with limited time or resources. So you didn't need a full mm. gym to do it. And you could do just enough, but often to build strength. So it wasn't something that would make you overly sore or would make you need crazy amounts of recovery time because these people had to be on for their jobs. So it came over to the US. I don't know exact date on it, but a guy named Pavel basically is credited for bringing it here and starting RKC and then Strong First, which is an organization we learned from to use the kettlebell. So I think they just started appearing in gyms because, you know, brands were manufacturing them. But people like us, we, we were initially attracted to them because we trained in a gym where I think this happens in so many organizations. You have someone that is a leader or someone that's doing something that you're like, wow, I want to be like you. We had a guy at our gym named Ed. Do you remember? Yeah, Ed, Ed Cashin. And great. he was strong. Yeah. He was like probably 45 or 50 Beast. 10 years ago, lifting crazy weight, like looked fit, acted fit, his work ethic, all of it. And I noticed because, you know, in, in our industry, not super female dominated, right? We're some of the only maybe female trainers in our gym. All the younger guys just flocked to Ed. And we were like, we need to know what Ed's up to. Yeah. And that's how we got the taste of it. So I think it started really in those smaller circles of trainers. And through my career of training people to use kettlebells, up until fairly recently when they become more, I guess, mainstream. Um, and it they're was, not right now. Would you say that they I think are pandemic, still on the pandemic? Yeah, I think, I think mm. in our circle, it may feel like it is. Yeah, it but, may feel that way just because we surround ourselves with other like-minded f people. But I still feel like not everybody, it's, I don't, I wouldn't say it's totally mainstream, but over the pandemic, I feel like it got more. When people were searching for equipment and they couldn't find it, they were like, oh, it's like a dumbbell. And I think that this is where people get confused because although you can use it for strength training, like a traditional dumbbell, like just, I mean, you lift a heavy weight, you're, you know, working your muscles. There's so much more you can do with kettlebells to get into the cardio aspect or mm. just power training. And that's where we found the benefit. And that's where people don't know how to use them. They might pick them up and do a row with them or see people swinging, but maybe they don't exactly know why they're swinging. So there's it. still this gray area where they like, I see them, I might have some, but I don't know what to do with them or why I should be using them. Would you say when you're thinking about kettlebells, it's primarily strength or is it endurance? Does it depend on how could someone utilize this tool? Right now, you know, for example, my patients think about strength training, they'll go, they'll do squat, deadlift, bench press, or they'll do machines. Mm -hmm. And then separately, they'll go and do cardio. So now, and listen, there's benefits in each modality. Yeah. And the general recommendations are 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity mm -hmm. and, you know, adding in some strength training. But what I'm hearing you say is that the kettlebells have the capacity to be leveraged to do both in a shorter period of time. Yeah, Lacey and I talked a lot about that um, this morning and just talking a little bit about how it depends on your goals. It depends on how much time you have in a week. It depends on how much you want to put into it, right? For me, I want to be able to get in 40 to 60 minutes, four days a week, and I don't want to walk to a gym. I don't have time, or my goal right now is to spend as much time with my family on our business and I need to maximize the time that I have at home. So I've been able to make really great gains cardiovascularly and strength wise just using kettlebells. I think the CrossFit community sort of was the first bigger, I don't know, maybe mainstream thing to really use them. And when I think of kettlebells, I think of fitness, overall fitness versus just like bodybuilding. Like if you came to me and you're like, I want to do a figure competition, I want my body to look sculpted in this way, there's a lot of components that go into that. As you know, nutrition, rest, mm -hmm. hypertrophy, strength training. Missy, with the choices she's making in her life, that probably wouldn't be a fit for her. So if she came in and said, I want to be the fittest I can be as a mom of two at 40 years old with a business, I would think ding, 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 kettlebell training's for her. I wouldn't match her necessarily with something else, um, knowing what I know as a trainer. Hmm. So 
we always talk about going back to the goal. If you want to run a marathon, your training might look a little different because we love, I mean, we, we obviously are biased to kettlebells, but we love all equipment. I use barbells often, love gym machines. It just really depends sometimes on what you want to get. But if overall fitness, if we're talking just fitness as far as strength, as far as endurance, as far as cardiovascular health, you can just get a lot of bang for your buck with this one thing. That's amazing. Yeah. Kettlebells, what you're saying is kettlebells can get you fitter. Yeah. yeah. One piece 100%. of benefit, yes. which is, you know, I used during the pandemic. And yep. when I was pregnant, obviously I wasn't, you know, traveling all over the place. We used, what, two kettlebells. Two. I was able to maintain uh, an appropriate, a pretty solid level mm -hmm. of fitness yeah. through uh, my pregnancy. You know, you mentioned something that kettlebells are a tool, right? So this is this big chunk of iron with a handle and that potentially you could get better at other things. Mm -hmm. You could potentially get better at running. You could potentially get better at any sport component. What would be absolute movements that you think everyone who is training with kettlebells should be able to do? And obviously I realize that there's a progression and there's a beginner is different than someone who's more advanced, but are there certain movements that everybody who is using a kettlebell should do? So kettlebells are great because they really focus on hip power, and core strength, right? And that translates over to everything in life, right? Whether it's sports, whether it's me running after my children, whether it's, you know, walking up and down subway stairs, hip strength and core strength. So it's really, they're really fantastic for athletes on and off season, right? You are not gonna always do the same movement. You're gonna continually throw a ball. Um, if you think about overhead movements, uh, push press, jerks, um, that's vertical movement, right? So you wanna think about like throwing a ball. Horizontal movement like swinging a kettlebell, maybe hoisting yourself forward. So just core strength, hip strength, um, and it translates over to literally everything we do in life. My, my boyfriend and I, he's like, I don't even know what to say. He's like he's my a life partner boyfriend. But he's a professional athlete, isn't he? he? He is a, like, he's a runner and he owns a company that programs for endurance athletes, like large scale. And he he's the head coach for New Balance in Mexico. So he's, basically like triathlete level and runner level. He's like top notch. And is he a kettlebell master? So I've recently <laughs> gotten him into kettlebells because he did not, he's seen me use them, but he recently was like, I see so much connection in the movement and it all started because we played this little game on the weekends, we'll be going out getting coffee, driving around and we live in a very active place where people are running all the time and we we're both movement people. We watch people move and we'll be like, that woman's hips that one's left foot, that one's, you know, many things. We'll like analyze run form in the moment. 85 to 90% of people have subpar run form because of weakness. And we always identify what Missy exactly said, the hips and the core. People don't have enough upper body strength sometimes to, or core strength to hold themselves up. It could be arm weakness, which affects how fast they go because your legs will move at the velocity of your arms. A lot of runners don't realize that, that how fast your arms go will directly carry how fast your legs go. So if you fatigue very quickly up here, you're not gonna be able to keep your speed up, even if your legs have the stamina, the power, or you have the cardiovascular ability to keep going. Um, and then the hip strength, and that's where people get into funky stuff with their knees, their ligaments, um, ankles, all that. So our whole body is connected through our kinetic chain, your feet matter, all that matters, and those areas I'm always like, people need kettlebell training. People need kettlebell training because there's so much explosivity in what we do in kettlebell training that lends to sports. And for runners, specifically, the position that you hold when you run, you sort of bend at the ankles and you have forward motion. A lot of people end up going up and down like this when they should be moving forward. The kettlebell swing is actually that action of propelling yourself forward, your feet are just attached to the floor. So he had this moment one day training with me where he was like, oh my God, runners should be doing the swing because this is what you do when you run. This is going to give them the strength, the force, keeping their body in that upright position because in the swing at the top, you're standing tall, core is engaged, all that. And that's where yeah. we see it translating for people that, you know, we're not like, go be in the weight room your whole life. People want to do other yeah. stuff, you know? And take it even a step further, like you're, you know, life partner is a, you know, professional runner. My husband sits at a desk, he works in finance. He wants to run 
um, the days that he exercises, but he sits, so he needs to work on his core and his hips. So three days a week, he does kettlebell training, you know, because he is that person who, I mean, we, we sit for a living. So we may not sit for a living, but a lot of people sit for a living, and until you fix those, until you address the core and the hips, it's really hard to move, um, pro- I don't want properly through life. We also have this moment right now, I'm like so passionate about this, that people go from sitting at a desk to sitting on a spin bike. I think it's like this epidemic yeah, totally, right now. Totally and our that. hips are in this shortened position. So of course that's gonna cause issues when we lengthen them and stand and go about normal life or go to try to run. So it's bringing awareness to that. Like, okay, how can we counteract those repetitive movement patterns that you do all day that could be holding you back from what you wanna do? That's a really important point. Basically, you can leverage kettlebell training to counteract Mm -hmm. a sedentary lifestyle, even if your goal is not to be sedentary and you're going to the gym and you're training, you're doing an hour of training and then maybe Mm -hmm. you're walking at lunch. Thank you to one of the sponsors of the show, Cozy Earth. Listen, I will tell you that I have been using Cozy Earth for the last couple of years And as we are rolling into this holiday season, I may or may not have gotten myself and my husband matching Cozy Earth pajamas. And yes, former Navy SEAL is wearing them. That just goes to show you how soft they are. They are beautiful. They also have Cozy Earth bedding, towels, clothing. Uh, This stuff is the softest stuff you will ever, ever feel against your body. I love this company. And my audience saves 35% on all Cozy Earth. Go to Cozy, C-O-Z-Y, earth.com slash Dr. Lion, and you will save 35% on these luxurious, premium, 100% viscous made from bamboo, meaning it's so lightweight, soft, temperature regulating, You will sleep with these pajamas, the most comfortable you have ever slept. You know, when I curate sponsors for the podcast, I only pick products I absolutely love. And this is on my favorite list. If you've been on my newsletter, you know how much I love Cozy Earth. So go to CozyEarth.com slash Dr. Lion. And they so generously provided 35% off. In terms of uh, strength, Could someone, would you say it's more effective if someone was starting on a strength program and they love doing their cardio? Mm -hmm. So like your husband Mm -hmm. loves doing his running um, and your life partner's a runner, so he's a freak, he's out. Um, (laughs) He really really is actually. You're out, buddy. Uh, In terms of your recommendation, would it be more beneficial for them to actually be swinging kettlebells, using kettlebells versus going to the gym and squatting, benching, deadlifting? You guys, looks like you have two different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you, go you go. So, in my opinion, yes, because I think kettlebells also mimic certain things that we do in life, and this is also why I love them for moms, right? Um, a movement like carrying the kettlebells, right? Think about two shopping bags down at your sides, right? Squeezing your armpits when you just the act of squeezing your armpits. Everybody out there, go squeeze your armpits. You naturally, your back starts to do things, right? So, it's just learning how to do things that you do normally in life. So I think kettlebells are able, are a tool that can help you learn how to do that. And that's how we teach them to people. Um, Carrying a child, right? When you rack a kettlebell, which is holding it maybe on one side, one side is loaded, one side is not loaded, right? So squeezing the armpit, aligning your hand with your shoulder. I'm not saying we move through life like robots and holding kettlebells, but you, it's just learning how to engage your muscles and stand appropriately and the kettlebells sort of help you do that. They do help you do that. And engaging your core, breathing through that. um, It just, it mimics sort of everyday life. I'm not saying it should always take place of barbell movement or take place of the running, but it enhances all the other movements. So for me, I would teach those basics first, how to pick things up, how to put things down. Um, Versus a squat, deadlift. Yeah, because it's a stuck position on a bar, right? Our life is not stuck in a bar. So my time on it is a little bit, but very similar. I think if they need to understand what the person in front of you needs, and that's very easy with an individual. If you're a trainer and you and you know, can do an investment with that person, per- doing it on a bigger scale or for people sort of like what we do in programs, we try to we pick the 
the best box and box people could fit into. But how I look at it, I had an experience training in New York City as an independent trainer, a lot of people in um, senior populations, so people over 60. Um, and these people, it might in some cases be too much for them to just start out with a free flowing movement holding their body up. So maybe putting her in a leg press machine or having her squat in a machine where the machine gives her that stability at first, that could be a path that I start her on. Mm -hmm. And again, it doesn't mean machines are the answer cause, because I could put a 65 year old woman that has never lifted in a machine, even at her body weight, just to keep her in that position and she'll get adaptation from that. I could put a strong bodybuilder in there and load that thing up with tons of plates and they're gonna get an adaptation. So it's almost matching the person with it. And where Missy comes into play, what she said, I would probably still use kettlebells with that person in maybe their warm up at first, holding, could be balancing, could be just supporting one at their chest. And then we start to progress her as she's, you know, maybe good and stable in her squat. We take her and put her in a real life position where her joints could handle it. So it's really kind of, and that's obviously an extreme example. We've, it's actually very sharp. Yeah. That is a very uh, sharp observation. Being able to put someone um, that maybe is older or really deconditioned mm -hmm. and untrained, yes. forcing them to be in a position and, you know, in terms of safety is probably, you know, when I, I was doing uh, research, that's how we would use mm -hmm. Uh, machines. So yeah. we didn't actually, you know, I'd been thinking about this when in all the resistance training that we did during my time, we never used kettlebells. Mm -hmm. We always use machines. And the question is, is that beneficial? It's very easy to measure. It's very easy to measure their strength, whereas um, they'd be less likely possibly to injure themselves. But we're taking away any kind of explosivity. 100%. We're taking any kind of translatable mm -hmm. action out, right? So you don't go and do a leg press in real life. I mean, what would you do? Press on the gas? Versus what Missy is saying mm -hmm. is actually you are picking up your kids or or even, um, you know, when you get on the airplane, I see some women struggle, some men and women struggle to put things overhead. Maybe that wouldn't relate to kettlebell, but I would imagine that the capacity to move the kettlebell will translate. And more. that's where we go back to fitness. Like we're sort of in this middle ground where we're not full on bodybuilding for just aesthetics. Although a lot of those movements can help you move better. If you're stronger, just in general, you're probably gonna move better. Where the fitness comes in, it's almost something that I do love about what has happened in the CrossFit world mm -hmm. is they've kind of combined it. I mean, we, we don't agree with a lot of that method too, but it's like- So my CrossFit like, competition is out? <laughs> no, that's okay. I, I, I love the idea <laughs> trying that, it, that trying you can be fit yeah. and move and be fast. And I think people are missing the athleticism and yeah. people, adults want to be athletic. You can, I can't even count on my hand how many tennis players I've trained or people that, who knows, pickleball is like taking over the world. People want to be able to do that. And we should be able to do that. Like, we should. Yeah. And I mean, the way that you can move with the bell, we're both also, we're kind of like <laughs> veterans in the industry now. Yeah. We're not, you know, new trainers. Yeah. Like we're, you know, up getting close to 40. That's, you know, older for like trainers that are, right. I guess, sometimes visible in fitness right now. And the way that we train has had to adjust and the kettlebell always stays a centerpiece because it always somehow relates back to what we need. And I would say no matter what we do, we train a little differently, but we both use kettlebells probably 80% of our training. And even if you cycle back to that person you're just talking about, about lifting up overhead, they could be tight in their chest. Yeah. They could have overhead weakness, but what's happening in their core and hips when they're lifting that thing overhead. So just like understanding, I think with the kettlebell, how to move your body in space yeah. with load. And what would be, if you were to pick your top three movements with a kettlebell that everybody should do, what would they be? I think honestly, not everybody should swing because obviously this is gonna depend on if someone's had like discs fused or whatever, but the majority of people, I would always try to get them into kettlebell swinging for that explosive power through the hips because you know, something we can touch on, Missy is sensational with working with mothers and women that have had babies. You know, we talk about the pelvic floor a lot and a lot of women wanna come back to running or doing high impact stuff right away kettlebells, you can get that explosivity and um, power with your feet on the floor. So I could take a woman that loves running 
and I could actually train her with the force of a, a jump. Like especially, especially when you're kettlebell swinging, think of it almost like doing a broad jump. Like your feet are on the ground, you would propel yourself across the floor if you were doing a body weight. The kettlebell, you're throwing the weight in front of you essentially through that powerful hip thrust. So we can actually train a lot of those qualities that we would get with high performance sports like jumping. Think of like a snatch is sort of like doing a box jump without your feet leaving. And you so, would do this all with kettlebells? Yeah, so we As opposed to a barbell snap. You could, it's actually quite similar. Like a lot of those barbell power movements, they very much mimic the kettlebell, but the kettlebell to me is a little more fluid. You're not stuck in one position like you would be with the barbell with the weights here. So you would say a swing would be number one? I would for say For most swing. people, and mm -hmm. how, and there's ways, so sometimes people, there's different kinds of swings, right? There's one that goes straight up, and then one that is shoulder height, is yep. there, is there a correct way to do a swing? Is there a different, view, they're different? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah different we, kinds yeah, of swings. You know, we, we, we train hard style, which means like we stop like at the shoulders, that? hard style. Hard. So we stop at the shoulders. So when, you're, when your kettlebell stops the, uh, at the shoulders, your arms are straight. If you were to place yourself down on the ground, you'd be in a plank position on your fists, right? So core is tight, booty's tight, like legs are tight, like the whole thing, chin's tucked back. We're not looking about throwing the bell overhead, we're not, it's not a fluid movement. It is a hard style kettlebell swing. So it swing. comes, it's derived from um, martial arts training. So it's a blend of tension and relaxation. So in, in hard style kettlebell training, you're either very tense or you're very relaxed. And this is one of the harder things to learn in the ballistic style of movement. So swings, snatches, anything power, cleaning the bell, um, and we teach this because you get that maximum muscle contraction. There's another style of kettlebells called kettlebell sport or Gerovic kettlebells. And you, you might have seen that. They're the big competition bells that are colored and they have like we metal have some handles. of those. Yeah, we have those. Yeah. Those ones are meant for endurance kettlebell work, which we're not what does that trained mean? in that. What does that mean? Endurance so they do work. long form movements like you might have 10 minutes of doing a kettlebell snatch or like a jerk. And those are meant to be done, they do competitions for it actually, for endurance. Um, they're generally done lighter and more fluid with the body. So Missy said, you know, that tension, they don't keep that tension. They actually, if you see it, when they snatch, they sort of like use momentum from their body. I almost look at that more like a low impact cardiovascular training versus the strong muscle contraction and power training. So. If I want to train sport, think of it like, I mean, this isn't a, a very, this is a very simple example. Think of that like a marathon runner. Think of what we do like a sprinter. Love it. And it's harder. Those bells are shaped differently. They're bigger. So they so sit diff differently. Difficult they sit different, to carry. They're difficult to carry. They, say, they sit very differently on your wrist. Um, they, they're just bigger. So our kettlebell style is like the kettlebell. they all weigh the weight. same, no yeah. matter the size. So you... Yeah, Some of the dudes you see throwing around like big kettlebells question that on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Like that could be an eight kilo. You yeah. Know. <laughs> but my other favorite move is the Turkish get up yeah. because it's but just it's, it's getting up and off the ground, which as we age is harder for people. Across so the population. Yeah. We use that the most yeah. The anyway. Turkish get up by far is, I mean, especially for postpartum recovery because it strengthens it strengthens your core in a way that no other movement mm -hmm. is going to strengthen if you're focused on core, you know, core specific movements. I use the Turkish get up. And this would not be a movement we would program for hypertrophy. We're not like you're going to get jacked shoulders from the Turkish get up. But for someone that sits a lot, which most, if you train general population people, that's a thing. They're getting the rotation, the shoulder stability to just hold it up here. That forces you to do it in motion. So we look at that one almost like it's greasing up the machine. Yeah. It's not really like. So you're not doing it to I wouldn't increase. do it to like build my shoulders per se, but I would do it to Grease the grooves is what we like to strength say in and, our or, but strength as well or more stability. Both movements. I would say both. It's kind of this it's kind yeah. of the same thing. And so we we have the swing and once we go through the your final choice of exercise, I'm curious as to uh, what a programming uh, perspective would be because you said that the other bells were used for more endurance and they were going 10 minutes straight yeah and they're not focused on tension. You know again and I, I've trained with Missy for many years the swing the Turkish get up which. You actually, you guys go pretty heavy on. Mm -hmm. um, and then what is the third, the third exercise that everybody should be able to do? I think I know what you're going to say. You say yours first. I have, I have one. 
I should write it down. Everyone should be able to. Well, I love the overhead press. Okay, mm -hmm. I was wrong. Because they're also such great variations if you have good overhead strength of like also building endurance if you're not into snatching, if you're not into swinging. So if you have good overhead strength, you can still get really great endurance by push pressing, by jerking, um, if swinging and snatching are not your thing. I do think too, there's, people ask all the time, can I sub a dumbbell in? And most things you kind of can with a kettlebell, you could interchange them, but the ballistics, it's not the same. They don't fall appropriately, they're harder to hold, but in an overhead press, because of the natural movement of the shoulder, and because the dumbbell, think it, I mean, it looks like a little mini barbell, the weights are out here versus hugged against your body. To us, this feels like more of a natural position for your shoulder to move through. And we both feel like with clients, it, it doesn't feel as clunky as being here. You can sort of fluidly move. So I, I would prefer actually to press overhead with a kettlebell. So is, over that, your, is that your, I was going to guess you guys were going to say carry. Oh, well, yes, I, we love carrying. I mean, it's, it's again, an overall total bodies thing. It's, it's something we all do in life, right? So if you have a hard time carrying things during the day, you better think about that when you're training. Somehow that needs to come into your training, I, right? That that's the biggest thing I think. Looking at your life and being like, what's difficult for me? Where are the where are the areas for opportunity yeah. for me to put that into my training, and not always think I need to get this amount of sets and reps and X Y Z. Like, what's difficult for you physically in your life? It could be mentally, and get that into your training. Bring that up. Like, use it as an area of opportunity. I actually um, was listening to. I, th I think it was a it was a, a podcast and there was a doctor on and he said it's like every person should be able to carry their body weight for 60 seconds in their hands like you should be able to take one kettlebell one kettlebell you know grip strength all of that indicator of overall fitness um, you should be able to hold your own body weight whatever you are now do you, you believe that to be true and I was thinking yes. yeah I was like how many people could do that I mean yeah. we do a lot with hanging from a bar and different stuff too and I do think that that is one thing. And, you know, I just went in actually for a tune up. I have a physical therapist here in New York that I see who's amazing. And he had me doing single side heavy carries. And he was like, you know, touch your back here. Is your, are you tight right there? Can you feel your muscles working? Because I sit a lot now. I have like more time than ever on a computer. Um, and I think like so many people aren't aware of the balance in their body. If well, there's stable yeah. in their core, if not. So. Right. I mean, if you can't hold something, what what's going to happen, right? Your fingers start to lose grip. Your shoulders start to rotate forward. Your face is crunching. Like, I can't hold this thing, right? But if you have strong hands, you're going to have strong shoulders. It's just, it's kind of obvious. And it kind of weirdly makes people more aware. So it's this thing that brings awareness to movement. Because I you know we're trainers. Movement is our blood. Like, we think about it. I mean, I watch runners for fun, like, and analyze their movement. Most people That's are going. Kind of weird. Yeah, most people are going. Yeah, most people are going about. Okay. Watch out, everybody! If you yeah. see on the street, I'm judging you. No, <laughs> most people go about their life and they're not thinking about it. They've got you know their job, a million things, but if it's that one moment where like I'm going to stand up a little taller and balance my center of mass while I'm carrying this Whole Foods bag and walking upstairs, that can make a huge difference over time on their knees, on on a lot of things. So let's say someone is going to start with three movements. They're going to start with the swing. The Turkish get up, and obviously they'll progress up, and then a press. Mm -hmm. The listener at home is like, I have no idea how to start my weights. Uh, what weight should I start? Is it, you know, if it's a guy or a girl, what weight should they start? What kind of, and I know rep schemes vary, but um, if you were to just kind of make an overall generalization, what should they be able to swing? So this isn't an exact science because obviously every individual is different. Of um, but 30% of your current body weight is a good place to get maximum power output from a swing. Someone might go a little bit lighter than that at first because we want to create the pattern first. And usually when we're teaching it, we start, can they do a hip hinge? Because a swing- And what's a, and what's a hip a, hinge? A hip hinge is sending your hips back in space. So we've got squats, which are knee dominant. We're sending our butt down by bending our knees. Hinging or deadlifting is hip dominant. So think of me like shutting a car door with my booty or something like that. Like I'm standing and sending my hips back. When you do a swing, you're doing the motion of a deadlift just very fast. So we would start, can they hinge and keep their shoulders above their hips with their core engaged? They're not rounded forward. And then we would teach the clean. So we would teach one bell, 
thrusting the hips to bring it up the body, which is the pattern of the swing, just a little less, you know, scary and right. dangerous of one thing coming out in front of you. And then when we would progress that up to the actual swinging motion. And this is what we do with our platform. We try to take people from where they're at and move them through the line to get them to the full expression of the movement. So once they're swinging 30% their body weight, how many times are they, because you're doing both, again, you're talking about a ballistic style of movement, which is explosive. Mm -hmm. And you're also looking at cardiovascular activity, but it's, you know, you're not talking about zone two training, right? No one's talking to you <laughs> right. while you're doing this. <laughs> Lacey <laughs> loves zone two training. I love, I love so, zone two training. Okay, so, but are you using a kettlebell to do zone two training? Yes, you can. Or, we yes. are. Okay. Yes. Well, we are. We are. Yeah, in our, in, our, in our programming, we don't call it zone two. We call it RPE, rate of perceived exertion, right. seven to eight, right? And that's where we keep our people most of the time. And I think that's a missed mark in the fitness industry because most people are working at an RPE 10 all the time, maxed Fine. out. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Get yourself Injury, together. Burnout. You're like we're looking at together. longevity here, okay, okay, fine. Dr. Lyon. Um, we want to keep people healthy as long as possible, right? We want to keep people strong for their life. We're looking at the whole picture. Okay, so they're getting off the yep. computer. Yep. They're picking up their 30 percent of their body weight. They're swinging it. They've done the the clean. They're ready to swing. How many swings are they doing? So. I would say if you're starting someone that is newer to swinging, we're never going more than 10 reps, ever. And then 10 resting reps, for how long? 10 reps is like our max. So if you're hitting 10, you could be resting anywhere from 30 seconds to three minutes, depending on the person, how much expenditure they actually needed to jump that weight. We kind of lend more to a one-one or one-two rest ratio. So a lot of times in the beginning, if someone's exploring this learner, I'd say time how long it takes you to do a swing. We know that 10 swings typically take someone about 20 seconds. 20 seconds of a fast explosive movement, think of it like a sprint. It's a, that's a lot. So maybe we would say, oh, sorry, 10 seconds. So this would be like, you could say, you know, 10 swings would be the maximum amount that we'd probably get that are good out of that. Yeah, you want them to be flawless. This is not flawless a execution. low movement. So we're thinking we're going to have you perform that, your 20 seconds or 15 seconds, whatever it takes you, and then you rest for at least that amount of time or maybe double that amount of time. And how many um, sets are they doing? I would start someone at like 10 sets and then slowly progress That's over time. That's so easy. So basically, everyone listening, if you have an office job, you should yes. have a kettlebell yes. under your yes. desk. Oh, we recommend and this. Yes. Get up, yes. do it, and are they just doing it once a day? Could they do it more than once a day? Yes, Would and if you're be... not swinging, you could do explosive deadlifts, right? Put the bell on the ground, pick it back up fast. Put the bell on the ground, pick it up, up fast. If you're not there How with many the times a day, could they do this? So let's say someone is, we're really trying to counterbalance some of the sedentary lifestyle that you're talking yep. about, which we're all um, facing. Thank you to First Form for sponsoring this podcast. And in this episode, we talk all about muscle and strength training. When I think about muscle and strength training, I definitely think about dietary protein. Many of us are so busy. What is a way in which you can get protein in without having to sit down to have a meal? And that's when whey protein comes in, pure whey protein isolate called Formula One Natural by First Form. You can use this to help with any of your dietary protein needs. It has an optimal amount of branch chain amino acids. It's sweetened with stevia. You can mix it with water, or if you're like me, you could mix it with coffee, any liquid of choice. First Form, they make amazing products, and um, I know that you'll love them. There's many different flavors. I get this question all the time, what protein powder do I like if I'm going to use a protein powder? It is absolutely First Form Formula One Natural. That is my favorite. Okay, so you can go and check this out. First Form, go to 1ST p-h-o-r-m dot com slash Dr. Lion. And uh, you can browse their website, their clothing, any of their stuff. Um, they offer free shipping and 110% money back guarantee. I stand behind their products and they stand behind their products. So check out firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. I had a little challenge once during the pandemic where I was like, okay, I have, I personally have a 16 kilo kettlebell at my desk all the time. So 16 kilo that for times me, that's like 2.2, like okay. 35 pounds. 
So that one's like my desk bell. I use it to demo for clients. It's just around. But sometimes I'll pick it up and do maybe a couple snatches or single arm swings, whatever. We did a happy hour. So we said, set your alarm at the top of every hour. Your bell's by your desk, 10 swings. That's it. I, that's amazing. The other thing I so love. So they're swinging. Yeah. By the time you finish your day at work, I mean, you've got 80 swings, 100 swings. Right? Yeah. Would that Easy. count? Okay, so would that count towards their one of their days? So if, they, if an individual is relatively sedentary, they're mm -hmm. doing their cardiovascular activity, they're not hitting the gym because they're busy or whatever the, the issue is, now would you count that as, so this is, it's not hyper. Would it count as hypertrophy, Jane? No, but this counts towards strength. I would say that counts towards and some strength, power, okay. and cardiovascular training. And it also contributes to counteracting that shortened position of them sitting if they are sitting. Um, so the other thing, and this is why Missy is like full on in kettlebells in her life, is 20 minutes with a circuit with little rest could be a cardiovascular set. It could be Missy does squats and presses on a timer for 20 minutes, and that's her session for the day. Every day? Is that every day for you? Mm -hmm. I could do every day, five to seven days a week. For a, so you're talking about a kettlebell squat. For a kettlebell squat, is that still, so basically the swing is 30% of your body weight. What about a Turkish getup? The hard thing. Wait, 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 time out. Yeah. The, what's the Turkish getup? Because yeah. that is really difficult, and I'll link to some video, I'm sure you guys have some video of you doing the, the Turkish getup. Right. What about that for yeah. how much weight would you do? Well, I think the Turkish get-up is, is a hard movement for people to get no matter how physically fit they are, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I start everybody off with their body weight. Bridge. And then... No, oh, their body was like, gosh, 110 yeah. pounds of yeah, Turkish no, get-up. Oh, that yeah. no, that, I don't really, think I could do that. No. Okay. No, I just okay, tried getting it. people getting got up it. and off the floor and got to it. sort of piggyback what Lacey's saying about the swings. Something I might suggest for somebody is... A similar thing, but it's like swing, swing at the top of one minute. Turkish get up on the right side the next minute. Swing again. Turkish get up on the left side the next minute. So sort of, Turkish get up and swings can kind of go very nicely together because you're working on that posterior chain. You're getting that rotation in your spine from sitting all day long. You're working on the shoulders. You're learning how to you. You're um, getting that core strength in and. Um, the Turkish get up and the swings just marry really nicely together. But mm -hmm. as far as weight, I start everybody off with body weight, even in a warm up first, and then you can add weight from there. And then the pressing was the last move that you guys were talking about. Where, how could someone gauge if um, they're gonna, I guess, get two kettlebells or could they start with 30%? Where, where's the gauge now for a press? So the Probably. Turkish get up's a great um, kind of movement screen for that because we first would have to make sure they can even hold here with a straight arm. We want a locked out joint, so they have to be able to press it without this bend. It has to be fully locked out. A locked out joint is a safe joint, it's supported. Um, so if they can hold the bell over their head, we would start them with, we um, would have them do a clean to pick the bell up and they can do that with an assist from their other hand. Starting in the rack position here, they could help themselves press it and then they would just work on holding it. So we could work on the positions of that and figure out a weight that worked well for them. Typically, we tell people you should be able to press it for at least five reps comfortably before you go up in weight. So that would be finding the right weight. Um, it might be something as small as like a six kilo, which is like 13-ish pounds. It could be a little lighter. It could be starting with a dumbbell if we don't have a kettlebell that's the right size, especially if they can't hold this. An inhibitor to kettlebell training is it rests on your arm. So some people have a lot of trouble they're not able to hold this. So we have to first see that that works out. The getup usually allows us to see that pretty well because they're maintaining this through different positions. Another humbling thing is to add in, forget even weight after your body weight, and you understand when you have to move and where you have to put your body. It's just using a yoga block or a shoe on your knuckles. If it falls off, then you know that something is happening somewhere in the line right before you add that weight. Whether it's whether it's your wrists are broken or you can't fully lock out at the top, why can't you fully lock out? Is your core weak? Are you arching forward? Are your ribs flaring? So all those things are sort of pointed out to us by just simply either doing a body weight get up or adding a yoga block. It's very humbling for people mm -hmm. who think, you know, just pick up a weight and wanna throw some stuff overhead. It's a really easy way to sort of correct correct some movement patterns. And people, um, a lot of times people are very weak in their mid back. So posterior chain behind your body is a major weak spot for most people. We tend to neglect it. It's like that constant, you know, you don't see the, the back of your body. So people are always like, I want the abs and I want, you know, the front of my body to look great. And they forget about back there. And that also is tough with sitting. So we 
you know, kettlebell training focuses a lot on the posterior chain, even just holding bells here. So even working that mid back for people, we do a lot of um, three point rows with desk sitters where you have a supported hand and you're working on just pulling. That can help with the overhead too. Cause sometimes people are like, I need mobility drills. And we're like, you just have some weakness. We need to address here so you can get there. And as you're thinking about, or as the person sitting at home is thinking about this, is that five, so once you can complete five reps with perfect form, you're pretty sure that you should be able to progress and go up. Yeah, totally. I think that we use that as a test that people could do at home. So the end of our programs, typically depending on the goal, we test a couple of movements so that you kind of understand where you're at, how much growth you've had over the past. Most of our programs are three months, so you can see where you've grown in how the three months. How fast should someone get, how fast should someone progress in strength? So this is a tricky one, another one I'm passionate about. <laughs> People ask all As the time, you be. how do I measure this? <laughs> this and, is what we do is we measure. You know, Missy and I work a lot with beginners and intermediate level yeah. when they're coming into weight training. And there's this thing in fitness or strength training called beginner gains, where the first six months, if you're undertrained or untrained, you can make crazy adaptations in that six month period because you're putting your body through stimulus that it's not used to. So your body wants to catch up and it wants to perform what you're asking it. So you typically will see people be like, oh my God, I'm like six months, I've completely changed my body or I feel so much stronger. Do they change their body, their body composition, or do they change their capacity to lift more? It could be both. So it, it does depend on factors like nutrition, and sleep and genetics, yeah. genetics, a lot on genetics. But I think that there's stats. It's like, you know, an untrained person could have like a 6% or maybe a 4% gain where a trained person might only get 2% from the same level from, of um, weight, mm -hmm. the weight that they could increase. Yeah. So as you get better, it kind of sucks. Yeah. It, the results or the visible results or whatever, it just gets slower because your body's adapted. So it, it's going to slow down. It can't keep adapting forever at that same rate. Let me ask you this. You guys have been swinging kettlebells for a while yeah. now. How do you progress your weight? So for a swing, what do you swing? I have a 32 at home. What do you swing? I'll swing my like my like happy weight is probably a 24 to a 28. If I'm swinging heavy, I'll swing a 32. Okay. Um, how where for for you, where do you see like could you increase that weight? Are you making plans to increase that yeah. weight? Is that a great goal? question? Like, so maybe for me it would be something like I play with the time. Right. So maybe it's like I'm increasing my endurance by, OK, maybe I can do what Lacey's saying, like 10 swings with a one to one rest ratio or one to two rest ratio. Maybe I'm increasing my endurance by um, maybe not necessarily the weight. Maybe I'm, I'm decreasing the rest and increasing that way. Okay. So I wouldn't use the swing for muscle hypertrophy. So I would use that for explosiveness and power training. You are going to get work for your hamstrings and your glutes, of course. So what would you're you, I can't wait, what would you use so, for muscle hypertrophy? So for muscle hypertrophy, I think with kettlebells and with anything, you have to look at what your goal is and where you're adapting to stimulus. So we said where most people mess up is they don't know what their goal is or they don't have any idea why they're doing what they're doing. So almost the best strength people are students of strength you have to pay attention to what you're doing. So if you're not tracking anything, if you're not writing something down, if you're not following a program, it doesn't, programs don't have to be complicated. They honestly don't even have to be that tailored to the individual, but you have to know where you were three months ago to know how to push yourself a little bit. And this is, goes back to the RPE training. We're trying to Just get people of perceived, perceived exertion. exertion. We're trying to get people to think of, if we're applying it to weights, if I'm, let's take the overhead press. If I was like, okay, I want to, I can press a 12 kilo bell, which is 25 pounds for six reps today. I want to be able to press that for 10 reps in three months or something. So I'm going to get a plan that slowly builds on my reps, or maybe I'm going to start doing a 14 kilo for two reps sometimes, and then I'll go back to the 12. So we have to show some sort of tracking. And then with our students, we're like, okay, RPE seven, think of it on a continuum of one to 10, make it easy. If we're at RPE 7 for this lift, you could probably do three more reps at that weight than what you just did, or depending on the sets of the movement, you could probably do more sets. So we can play with weight and sets like Missy was yeah. saying. And you're not pressing two days in a row, right? That's the key thing, and I think that's a huge miss in a lot of, you know, when people want to achieve a goal, 
they think they have to do the same thing every day. So the three exercises, the swing, three. Turkish get up yeah. and press, you don't want them doing it every day. You wouldn't do it every day. But for example, so if on Monday, let's say you're pressing your 12, ki you know, your 12 kilo for however many reps and your goal is to press it for 10. Maybe on Wednesday, you're working heavier Turkish get-ups because it's still overhead movement. You're still getting overhead work. And maybe on Friday, you're doing push presses. Again, still overhead work. And you're working on your endurance. And then the following Monday, you go back to maybe your, your 14 kilo, what Lacey's saying. You do less reps, heavier weight. Then on what, so you kind of you work it that way, but you stay within the range. So you're not always you're not working at a ten. You're not always working the same exact movement pattern, but you're you're getting stronger overhead. Mm. People are really uncomfortable when they weight train because it's hard. And the hardest thing for us is getting people to a point where they can hang on enough to feel uncomfortable because no one wants to feel uncomfortable now. We want to plug into a show and watch an instructor be like, let's have fun and. Here's my playlist. Has that always been sweat. that way, you think, in your training I experience? How, and how long have you been training people? So I've been training people since 2014 full-time. Missy has been longer, but I was in the athletic apparel industry for 10 years before that okay. in New York City. So we were both here when kind of the wave of fitness started with group classes like spin classes. And that became a big thing and a big social thing for people. And I think that I noticed since about 2010, I feel like at least here, it became more of a fitness as fun. So in the last 12 years, people have shied away from doing the difficult thing and not able to embra embrace any kind of discomfort, you and, think? And, yeah, I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years. Yeah. I, I was a trainer in college as my side thing, and then I realized it was going to be my full your, thing. Your side hustle? Yeah, right? hustle. Your full exactly, hustle. now my full hustle, which is such a blessing. But um, I, I think that what I've noticed, and in some ways it's great, right? Mm -hmm. There's so much more out there. People are moving, doing things. But in the other sense, it's like fast fashion. It's fast fitness. People want to bounce from one thing to the next, get their sweat in and get in and get out, and then they're lacking results. That's where Lacey and I saw opportunity in the industry to be, you know, like people need to stick to a program. And that's what people have a hard time with, doing, the, doing your homework. How and long do you think that people should give kettlebells? Would you say, okay, you are going to try, so you, you haven't really used them before, you're just doing, you know, the machines or the, the free weights you are going to dedicate X amount of weeks to uh, kettlebells. Would it be three months and then reevaluate? How long do you, would you say that you give them for uh, improvements and or just improvements in strength and what they're looking for? We like checking in every 12 weeks because typically that's long enough that you can evaluate some changes from whatever adaptation you're trying to receive. Um, less than that, you know, obviously we can look at programs and say, maybe this isn't working, let's tweak the structure a little bit or whatever, 12 weeks minimum. I think people need to give it a year personally in any kind of fitness thing that they're doing and give it that, give it their full attention instead of like what Missy was saying, jumping to, I'm going to do a boxing class and I do Pilates one day and then I'm going to do a hit class. I think a year for most people could change their entire life mm -hmm. if they focused on the big three things rest recovery, and I would include stress management in that, nutrition, and strength training. And honestly, we always talk about this, it's our job, so it's kind of funny, strength training is the low-hanging fruit here. Three days a week, most, most people could do three days a week and see such amazing results from that if they stuck to it and did simple movements. You know, we do the same. How many movements would you say, so if someone is doing three days a week of a kettlebell program, uh, what, what I would think that we're looking kind more of look like, like patterns. Like, right? So hinge. you need to hinge, you need to squat, squat. you need to rotate in some right. capacity, and you need to press. Hinge, squat, rotate, Row. lunge, yeah. push, pull, like the basic yeah. movements. You can do all of those with kettlebells. If you don't have bells, they can be interchangeable with a dumbbell sometimes or a barbell. I use barbell a lot because with kettlebells, the one limitation you really do have is your capacity to hold them. So sometimes if holding the weight is your limiter, like my legs are stronger than what I can physically hold on my chest. So I'll move up to a machine for certain movements, but that doesn't mean I can't, you know, crush my legs with unilateral split squats with kettlebells. Like my legs would be toast after a certain amount of reps. So we all have to kind of find our capacity mm -hmm. and blend in what our goals are for sure. track. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for the guys, I, you know, uh, I know a lot of knuckle draggers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my fair share, no offense guys. Um, could they say, I'm not going to do any kind of other lifting other than 
kettlebells. They're mm-hmm. going to do whatever kind of cardiovascular activity. Could a you know could a guy who again you know is like super used to doing just the free weights just do kettlebells for three months? I mean, cognitively they could, but could they get the load that they need? I think it depends on the person for yeah. sure. Some guys, sure. Like we're you're Missy stronger than most men, so I think like <laughs> I think like. Yeah. Those with guys, good form. With good but form. eventually, I do think if they have like, if you want to be lifting like a bodybuilder and doing that, you need to train like that. So, I, I I'm not going to be naive to the fact that kettlebells have limitations, but I do think for general population, they are the best tool. Like, if I'm going to invest money in buying something for a home gym or learning to use something, that would be the thing that I would do. And I think like personally, a combo of machines and kettlebells are great if you don't have a gym like i built a gym in my garage a pull-up bar a squat rack and kettlebells are sort of king and maybe you decide to get you know some other accessory stuff but you can do a lot missy has a pull-up bar and a bunch of bells and yep pull-up bar maybe 10 bells done she's pressing you know a 24 kilo which is 52 pounds she's like five foot one and a hundred and hundred pounds i don't know you're a tiny human so she's she's pressing she's pressing half her body weight and she has not touched a barbell or a machine in... since pre-pandemic. And I do. I, I really appreciate that you're recognizing some of the limitations of mm-hmm. kettlebells because that's important. So if we are here having this conversation, we don't want it to be uh, one-sided where kettlebells yeah. are the end-all be-all. But I, I, I do believe personally, which is why I wanted to have you guys on, mm-hmm. it's really an underutilized tool. Right. Um, and for the limitations for a lot of the general population and even the really busy executives, they could utilize a kettlebell and it would be so much more time efficient. Mm-hmm. What I do like that you're saying is you're not necessarily saying for the people that are really looking for maximum strength gains mm-hmm. that this is going to take the place of a heavy squat or a heavy deadlift, mm-hmm. um, you know, but it can facilitate the movements, the core strength, the breathing, which I hate to talk about, but I will. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because it's really, I, I like to think that I can talk about whatever I want on the podcast, but I would be uh, remiss to not speak about the fact that breathing is probably an important component as we're talking about all these other things. Yeah, a lot of times we even start with breathing in our warm-ups. Oh, um, brutal. I can know, it's right? so this, brutal. I know. It's just um, the it's most... Especially, yeah, you know, it's just basic, basic stuff that we, over time, from stress or the way that we move, the way that we sit, sitting in a car, the desk, we, you know, if you don't breathe properly, like your digestion's not going to work properly. How do you breathe properly? <laughs> well, you only I, get two minutes yeah, to talk about breathing. Yeah, I, I know. I'm, I'm going to time limit here. Um, no, we start off a lot of it with our, with our women, especially in our beginner program and our onboarding program, getting people to sort of breathe out of their head, neck and shoulders and understanding so that like. you're saying that people breathe. So people, here, people yeah, breathe up here. Which um, causes all sorts of tightness, not just in your chest, in your shoulders, in your head, right? And it causes, it can cause stress. Um, Yeah. So mindset, right? So just understanding that breath really needs to be thought about from like a lateral perspective, Mm -hmm. like breathing into your ribs laterally, right? So not, not like belly and chest sort of, if you place your hands on your ribs and take an inhale, your ribs move out to the sides. And this, I do this a lot with my postpartum moms, because as we know, our you know, our abs get stretched out, our our pelvic goes into a different position. So just sinking your breath with your pelvic floor alone is very healing and brings you into a parasympathetic state, first of all, off the bat, and then you're sort of more in tune. And then when you, you need to get that under control before we start loading movement, right? On top of, we don't want to load movement on top of a tight chest. So just breathing in through our nose, understanding breath needs to move laterally so that we can hold tension in our core, right? You need to be able to hold um, air in our evenly in our core so that when we start loading our body, we don't, you know, get aches and pains in our shoulders and our low back. So being able to hold tension in our body before we add load. And to do that, you would suggest people put their hands on their rib cage. Yeah. yeah. So that's effective yeah. like here. So it's it's kind of, ch- it's diaphragmatic. Yeah. So we want people breathing into their diaphragm. So it'd be like up in this. It's not belly. Like sometimes people get there with yoga breath. So you shouldn't be like sticking your belly out when you breathe. Or it's sucking really in. really trying to move this way. So before if you imagine. They pick up, before they pick up a weight. So yes. if they were going to swing. Yes. yes. Would they incorporate, would they think to 
to breathe laterally, pick up the kettlebell and then swing? Before they yeah. swing. And the swing breath is a little shorter, but we want to brace here. So we want our abs to be tight and creating almost like, we always liken it to putting on a belt or like a pool floaty filled with air. Yeah. You want that support. Like creating intra-abdominal pressure so you can protect your lower back, okay. right? That is the key here. We want to create that intra-abdominal pressure so equal air inside our core. And you do that by taking these deep breaths, right? And you could, we start, for the fast person who doesn't want to work on the breath, we may start them in a plank and ask them to do this type of breathing. Okay, get, let's get down in a, in a plank. Um, let's start breathing laterally into your ribs, less head, neck, and shoulders, and people start breathing into their ribs. And for them, for the person who doesn't want to breathe, we can sort of trickle it in, make them feel like they're not doing that breath Another work time that we like to teach it is during cool downs, because most time people don't need to be like, stretching a million if you've already worked out like your muscles are probably good. or you're like, hypermobile you don't need to stretch you don't need to be stretching after your training so getting back to that parasympathetic state calming people down people are stressed mm -hmm. people we have people that are amazing athletes that we train that are so stressed that they're so tied up here and they're like why isn't some of this stuff clicking and, and we're just like you need to breathe and let some of this tension go so the, the cool down is a great time to get someone to lay on their back and maybe actually work on that and calm them down and it actually feels natural because we'll missy's really great about this changing the breath cycles so maybe it's an inhale for five counts and then a full exhale for 10 seconds so you start calming them down and it's also a way we help people find their core because sometimes you're like use your core people like, what does that mean so we'll get people to lay down take a breath in and then a full exhale like every bit of air like your eyes want to pop out of your head and Every human, I don't care how weak your core is, yeah. will feel their abs yeah. in that time. And we can be like, okay, this is what we want to create when you're standing. So now we're going to flip you over and see if we can do that too. And that's the whole thing. It's like how to not get this yeah. or that. And the breathing is the... I mean, the breathing is basic. So if, you, if, it's, if you're having a hard time breathing, you need to get that under control before you start loading your body up with all sorts of weight. And the breathing can actually help with recovery. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like it can prevent, is it fair to say that it can prevent injury or at least bring awareness to a place in which you would become injured if your neck is tight, yes. your shoulders are tight? Um, is, oh, that, is that fair to say? Yeah, especially if you're lifting heavy, you need mm -hmm. that brace or you could load your joints. Or if somebody has a hard time sleeping, I'm like, what I'll often suggest for them to do. If is they're a the pillow over their face? Just kidding. <laughs> Stop <laughs> tape, breathing. Tape Don't do that at home, yeah. guys. Tape oh. your mouth shut. But really. What I'll suggest, I was like, you know, if you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, maybe that's a good time to, like, focus on your breath work, you know, and tune in with, um, tune in with yourself. And maybe sometimes people are even scared to go there, hmm. you know? I was doing some um, running over the summer, and obviously life partner run coach was telling me, like, in zone two, we don't want to push – that's our adaptation zone. So we don't want to be burning the candle at both ends up in zone three, zone four. Can you just want to mention be... for the, the listener the, what zone two, three, four? Yeah. All so the zones. think of zone two like the place where you're going to make the most adaptations. You're not going to be burning massive amounts of carbohydrates. Your body's not going to be overtired, overstressed. That's like the most basic way to think about it. So your body is able to build in zone two and increase your aerobic capacity. Um, the other is the training zones. Think of it like a zone four or five could be like your hit training, your sprinting. So we're kind of in that place. So he had me actually run in the zone two, which for me, I wanted to be, go out and be like, I'm going to do eight minute miles, which is probably my zone four or five because my adaptation is not there. He had me running about a 10 minute mile, only breathing through my nose and being like, <laughs> it is so hard to yeah. run and not breathe through your mouth. And the nasal breath gets that deeper breath that Missy was speaking about. A lot of us are mouth breathers and that's why we're shallow. It was the most challenging thing I think I'd done in so long, but at about two miles in, my body just relaxed. And I'm like, okay, this is it. It's that cyclical breathing. My body's not fighting for oxygen. Mm -hmm. I'm getting that oxygen in there and I'm able to hold myself up and not feel like I'm like a noodle running around. I think it's just we're always there's if you're if you're not in tune with the breath work, you're always in fight or flight. Right? And you don't want to be in fight or flight when you're like lifting ton of weight. Thank you to another one of the sponsors of the show, and that's insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion. 
Yes, that's again, inside, like insideyourbody.com slash Dr. Lyon. Why do you care about inside tracker? Because if you care about health and fitness, you should definitely know what your inflammation is like. You should know what your hormones are like. You should know if you are effectively training and eating the way that you should. And if you are, you actually should see that reflected in your blood work. InsideTracker.com was created by leading scientists in aging, genetics, and biometrics, which means you can track your data. It will analyze your blood, DNA, and fitness tracking data to identify where you're optimized and where you're not. So for a limited time only, get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Just go to InsideTracker.com forward slash Dr. Lyon. Why is Inside Tracker amazing? One reason it is amazing is you don't need to wait in line for your primary care physician. You don't need to have to be scheduled months out to get an appointment. You can actually get your blood work done on your own time, which I love, and I find that very efficient and effective. You can then take this blood work to your provider to review it. So go to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon for 20% off. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting and good perspective. What you're saying is that you can train, train hard, but actually be in a relaxed state mm -hmm. as opposed to a going to war state that is in really like martial arts. Intense. Tell, Gab, tell, tell Gabrielle, the, um, um, Dr. Lyon, the thing that you had the most trouble with kettlebell training when you started. Oh, slowing down. Shocking. Slowing down. <laughs> Missy Literally like, slowing down. I was, I'm like the micro machine man. <laughs> so kettlebell training is yeah. like a metaphor for life. I use this all the time when I'm actually on camera. I'm like, I find myself saying things. I'm like, this is a metaphor for life, guys. Let's slow down. Let's focus on our breath. Like these, the this type of training is is for me just it, it's a way to enhance life. Right? It enhances your life. It focuses on everyday movement. It um, gets you to f like slow down in the Turkish get up when you're doing a yoga block on the hand. Most people don't want to do that stuff. They want to just get in and get out, and they expect results. But it's tracking. It's programming. It's progressive. It's efficient. I think that it's a really fascinating conversation. And frankly, I hadn't thought about it before in the way that the training, you know, you're not utilizing it as a relaxation tool or a de-stress because I think I have a, a particular view on stress, which is maybe a, a slightly more aggressive view. Mm -hmm. um, but there is real potential to what you guys are saying mm -hmm. that the, the training in and of itself doesn't have to increase that perceived stress. It actually, even if you are pushing hard in the moment, the body is still relaxed. If the body is relaxed, the mind is relaxed and you are still executing. It's like you're able to tune out the noise. It's very cool. You know, yeah. um, you're able to tune out the noise. When someone is, you know, is going to shoot that, when a ba famous basketball player is going to shoot a three-point layup and is gonna win the game, you have to, in that moment, be able to tune out whatever's happening. And I think you can only get to that point if you're practicing these self-awareness techniques and these, this, you know, mindfulness and this meditation, medita meditative type of training, I think. And I think sometimes people think like, it's like the no pain, no gain, which you, again, we talked about, you have to get uncomfortable. Like if you're just pushing your sets at 60% of your capacity all the time, lifting the same weights you've always lifted for the same sets, you're not gonna get anywhere. You've got to be able to add those incremental changes. And where we find that it's sometimes deprogramming people, if people are burning themselves out in their workout, because training is stress, you're stressing your muscles, you're stressing your body to make it to adaptations. If you're taking it to the point where it's breaking down, you're going to come out of those classes or your sessions being more hungry. Like your body is going to want those simple carbs. Like if you come out of a session being like, I crave sweets or I like want that sugar, you probably went too far because your body's going up just wanting that glucose hit. And I think this happens more so sometimes with people that are running, but the hit classes, the spin classes, I think people get stuck in the, if they're not tracking their nutrition and they're not tracking their workouts, I think that's where the disconnect happens where people are like, why am I not getting results? I'm working out all the time. And they're probably overfueling with the wrong things and overtraining for where they're at. at that it's point. almost like you're um, in total control without feeling like you need to control. 
You know, mm -hmm. I feel like when people go to that 10, they feel like they are almost addicted to the 10. And then where does that get them, right? Eventually, eventually, it may take some people longer, but you're gonna get to this place of like crash and burnout. So our goal is to keep people in this place of always gaining, right? Come down and you come up, and you come down and you come up higher. You come down a little bit more, you come up even higher. And that's the way we train. I love it. And I want to make sure that we talk about in the, the space right now, there's a really big push to train with your cycles. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, those cycles could be what? Perimenopause, um, whatever. And then obviously menopause, which you don't have a cycle, pregnancy. What do you guys think about the, the concept of training with your menstrual cycle? I'm like, Mithy's like ready for me to go off on this. I'm just curious Here's because the there's a lot of, yeah. right, there's a lot of conversation yeah, about. A lot, and, a lot of and, noise. I get this yeah. question a ton yeah. in my direct messages on social media from women. We mostly train with women. Like I train men too, but we're very passionate about working with women. And I think this comes up a lot lately. And what comes into my head is like, why are we diagnosing something that might not even be something? What do you, what do you mean by that? Like, why are we making a problem that hasn't become a problem? And that's where it looks at like, I think that it can happen for many women. I think it also doesn't happen for many women. Meaning that like, women would struggle. Yes, during, during so, the, so typically yeah. during the luteal phase of your cycle, which is the time when your hormones are shifting a lot leading up to menstruation. Um, sometimes women have symptoms of being tired, extra fatigue. It is true, I think, that you know, women do want to consume more calories typically around that time. So there's varying degrees of, we can just call it PMS for lack of a better term. And I mean, I, I work with a lot of one-on-one -on -one clients and I, we exchange notes, it's all remote. And I do have probably like 20% of my, my women clients say, you know, I felt really off this week. It's, I'm, you know, my period's just starting. And that's a time when I'm like, okay, this is where we track. This is where we make notes of that for you. What does that feel like in your normal life? What could be contributing to those symptoms? Is it the gym? Maybe we shave a little bit off, but either stopping training or saying, I think a lot of things I see out there are like, go do yoga or like just do your breath work. Yeah. And if a woman doesn't Somewhat feel Somewhat disempowering, that, isn't it? Yeah. Especially if they feel great and they really want to be the best version of themselves. And there's a lot of influence mm -hmm. that I think layer that adds a layer of complexity that perhaps a lot of women don't experience it. And we know in medicine yeah. that what we think yes. Uh, yes. definitely can manifest. Um, so we're already setting them up to yeah. feel that way, even though they might. And then I think there's so much, I mean, I'm sure in functional medicine with women and working with people that our bodies are very complex. The There's so much out there marketed towards women now, like fix your hormones with this or take this thing. And I think it just can, if you're not digging into that on your own with your doctor, I'm not a hormone expert as a trainer. I just think it's a little fishy to be saying you should be paying attention to something that might not be occurring for you. And you should pay attention to it if it is. As it opposed could be a to sticking with your training program, yeah. let's say you're not a professional athlete and uh, consistency is a issue where you struggle and now we're putting yeah. in think, two like, weeks of um, some kind of yeah. alternative. It makes you just start thinking about something that may not have existed before. Yeah. And why put that in your mind when, I mean, like I never had an issue training my whole life. I've never even thought about it. And then there's recently just all this uproar around this topic. Yeah. And I do think it's legitimate for some people, like Lizzie said. Definitely you legitimate know, for some people. But, However, for the masses, are yeah. we? Is it something we should be focusing on? I'm not sure. And it goes back to, I think as trainers, we're dealing with people as holistic. You know, we have a strength expertise. Mm -hmm. We stay in our lane. We refer out to nutritionists. We've referred, I've referred clients to your practice mm -hmm. like that need help beyond the scope. I'm not a physical therapist. Like there's certain limitations mm -hmm. that we all have. In yeah, we have a huge referral roles. network. And I think with, with this specific thing, it's, it's just something that that training is, again, the low hanging fruit here. What's your stress level like? What's your caffeine consumption like? I know I've I, had issues. <laughs> yeah, I've had issues with as cortisol. As high as it can be. And I've worked on, I had some like tests done and blood tests. Like I think people sometimes don't think about that stuff and managing the actual roots. And right. then they're like, oh, it must be the gym. The like gym must have hurt yeah. my back. The gym must have made me too tired. 
where that is the thing that it might actually be right. the one thing you shouldn't get rid of. Like, like maybe just testing you your vitamin D levels. Yeah. <laughs> There's that. I mean, we live in New York City. Now, pregnancy. Yeah. People yeah. ask about can you train when you are pregnant? Yeah. Uh, can you mm -hmm. do our kettlebell safe when you're pregnant? Mm -hmm. Pre, postpartum? This is your yeah, wheelhouse this is amongst wheelhouse. others. Yeah, so this is such, um, just like talking about your menstrual cycle during training, I feel like as soon as people get pregnant, it's like you can't do this and you can't do that and all of a sudden you're fragile, right? And that is sort of like strikes a chord in me of like, the first thing I say to women, because people reach out to me on, my, on the DM, and they're like, can we just talk about what I should be doing? And I'm like, there's so much you can do. Let's not talk about what you can't do. Let's talk about all the things you can do, and you can actually start doing things, it, as long as you're not going to start training for a marathon you never ran before. Like, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's not but, a bad yeah, idea. Yeah, that's if you're pregnant or like, not pregnant, don't do it, don't do it, we you, don't recommend yeah, that. Yeah, we don't recommend that. But, yeah, you yeah. Should, but you're certainly not fragile. Right, and yeah. I think that that's where, um, what what makes you fragile is sitting all day long and not moving, right? And that happened before you got pregnant. It also puts you at risk for gestational diabetes. Totally. And it puts the baby at risk. We know that the fitter you are going into pregnancy right. and throughout your pregnancy, the better that the child is gonna do. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, there's so many great studies out there. One of the old books that I love to always bring up is Dr. Clapp. He, he did some of the first what studies. Was his last name? Dr. Clapp, K L A P P. I was like, oh, that, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. Is he OBGYN? Um, probably. Clapp. Uh, yeah. <laughs> is he an infectious yeah. disease? Right. Someone might get <laughs> I know, right? That's a, it's an the, the Clapp. Dr. Clapp. Yeah, yeah. Twist yeah. On um, but he, he's done so many great studies on like why women should be moving, why women should be working out through pregnancy. So, what is your recommendation? So, basically, the, the guidelines. Uh, say that you should continue to do your your yeah. activity as you've been doing it, and you're you've been working with a lot of a lot yeah of <laughs> pregnant women, mm -hmm. including myself. Um, by the way, I'm not pregnant right now. I'm totally done with that <laughs> like not situation. An yeah, yeah, no <laughs> closed door. Uh, yeah, we're, I'm so done with that. And um, you had me doing things that were prepping me for birth, like a lot of squatting, mm -hmm. a lot of pressing. Um, we actually did a lot of carrying mm -hmm. and a lot of pushing to get me ready to, you know, hold and carry and all that stuff. In terms of pregnancy, what are some core movements that obviously it varies depending on where you are in your stage of pregnancy? Right. right? Like, it, it's really uncomfortable. Yes. But what are just some of the things that you typically have all pregnant women do? Um, I mentioned this earlier, but I love Turkish get-ups, right? Getting up and off the ground, you're gonna be doing that for the rest of your life. So we might as well figure out how to do that under load. And that's the thing that I, that's like the piece I think people miss in this is like, we need to help you move better with more load, right? We need to get you comfortable doing certain movements so that when baby's here, when you're carrying multiple things, when you're carrying an offset load, you have baby in one hand, you have carrier, carrying things in the other hand. How do we do this safely so that you can do it subconsciously because you've been doing it in your training practice? The other thing I work a lot on is the breath work and getting really in tune with um, Harry, that intradominal pressure, right? How to protect your low back, how to move through space with now multiple different things going on with added stress, um, less time in a day, more things happening in a day. So in my opinion, all the things that Lacey and I talked about all matter when we're training pregnant people and more, right? Because now you're putting a baby inside of you and you're throwing off the whole kinetic chain, right? You're throwing off your posture, you're throwing off um, hormones. I mean, let's talk about hormones. Um, everything sort of doesn't feel like in your control anymore. So what can we control? The things we control is your training and how we're gonna make this better and easier, um, not just like during labor, but your recovery. Right. Um, how how often, how fast after do you typically in postpartum recommend women start training? So pretty quickly on within the first couple of hours, you can just start working on your breath work. Right. Connecting the diaphragm and the pelvic floor alone. Every pregnant person who just had a baby should have somebody come in and just talk to them about breath work. It would calm them down. Let's talk about connecting the diaphragm and the pelvic floor. Your cervix and your linea alba, the tissue that got stretched out to accommodate space for this baby and this human, um, is the same type of tissue, right? So connecting your breath with it, all of a sudden just, it starts healing all at the same rate. What Instead about of, diastasis? This is, there's so much talk huge also, topic. huge <laughs> topic about diastasis, but your abs obviously stretch out to accommodate space. I don't care 
who you yeah, are. Yeah, that would be weird if you right? didn't. It would be really weird yeah. if you didn't. Um, but again, just working on diastasis is all doing. Which is the separation of Separation the, of the abs. Yeah. Just working on that is actually going to do your pelvic floor disservice because your body is actually very intuitive. Shocker. <laughs> right? They, it wants to heal at the same rate. So if you give it the time and space to heal at the same rate, right? If you're just doing that breath work alone, your cervix and your core will want to heal at the same time. So just working on core is not a good idea and just going, just working okay. on pelvic floor is not a good idea. Seeing a pelvic floor therapist is an awesome idea. Um, but, and I refer everybody to pelvic floor therapists before they come back to me. So back to your original question, mm -hmm. what I like for people to do is go to their six week postpartum checkup, Go to, the, go to a pelvic floor therapist, and then I usually work hand in hand with a pelvic floor therapist because they know exactly what's going on. Whether you had a C-section or a vaginal birth, it's a really good idea to try to get in with somebody at least once um, to sort of just like assess what's going on there. And for most women, it just feels really good to be like, okay, like it's a little scary at first, right? Mm -hmm. Like, am I okay? Is everything okay down there? Like, or, you know, C-section, like I, it's a major abdominal surgery. So I think um, for me, within a couple of hours, it's a really good idea to just do the breath work, calm That's yourself down. Um, and then just, even if it's like, you know, it's not your first rodeo, third, fourth, fifth kid, right? Like, let's, you're crazy yeah. then, no um, offense, guys. No, I think that's kidding. awesome, more the merrier. Yeah, yeah. So, and then, and then you know, after that checkup, ideal, you see a pel pelvic floor therapist. Um, and if you are listening, tons of recommendations out there. You well, we'll link everything, yeah. you guys. In terms of strength, if mm -hmm. they are training is it possible to maintain your strength through pregnancy? Yes, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna give you a really great example. Um, use myself as an example. You're pressing 20 yes. kilo bells over your head? I have some really <laughs> great <laughs> footage of myself doing that. Of course, I'm breathing through the whole thing and I'm not working like to max effort all the time. I'm not, I don't think during pregnancy you should be doing one, one rep maxes. I don't think that that's a good idea. We should be holding our breath. Um, we need to really be in tune with that. Something. I was really passionate about during my second pregnancy was I was doing a lot of pull-ups. And I think um, in the beginning, right when I got pregnant, I don't know, maybe I was doing 10 or 15. But as my pregnancy went on, I was like, okay, the, what? this is probably not a good idea. I can't engage my core the same way. So what I did to maintain the same amount of volume is I just broke it up. I was like, okay, I'm gonna do three pull-ups for a half an hour. So it equal the same amount of volume. So there's ways to there's ways to work your program so that you're maintaining your volume, maintaining some of your strength. I love that. And But not working to this max effort all the time so you feel like you're tense and crunching your cheeks yeah. and you know not able to engage um, your core and hips and body in the same way. It's great advice. The idea that you have to become deconditioned during pregnancy yeah, is actually, I, uh, I don't believe that to be true. It mm -hmm. wasn't like that no. for both mm -hmm. my pregnancies and, and, and my friends that have kids mm -hmm. and and within the space, it's totally possible to yep. maintain a yep, totally possible a level of fitness. Again, mm -hmm. you're not hitting, you know, you're not going out and running sprints. I mean, maybe you are, but you'd have to check with your doctor. Yeah. Right. I wasn't, but there are ways in which you can maintain strength. It doesn't mean that pregnancy is, a, you know, no. it's not like an illness. No, and that's what's really frustrating about it. I think that I felt really empowered through both of my totally. pregnancies. Yeah. So I felt like Wonder Woman. You know, I was crushing it at life, and. I, Arguably, you still crushing that yeah, life. Thank you. Like, yeah, thank um, you. I always joke with my husband. I'm like, imagine what a third would do. I'd be really crushing it. Yeah. So I just feel like I just feel like it's not a time to make a woman feel like there's things she can and can't do. It's a time to empower this person mm -hmm. and make them feel like I mean, they you are superhuman. You're making a human, and also doing the, all the other things that you're doing, right? Um, so that's that's just my advice to all the people. You don't have to necessarily stop what you're doing, and you can still keep going. And typically the questions people send us about like programming for that, mm -hmm. the first trimester is obviously always the interesting one with how people feel. So like if you're nauseous all the time or if you're dead tired or whatever, like obviously you're going to work around making additions for that. Maybe you need to sleep more. And then usually they're like, when do I have to stop? Like what you're saying. And Missy's always so good with saying, you know, like this is where maybe when you're a certain size, yeah. you, you feel like her in the pull-ups paring down a little but not stopping again like yeah and again this is all so individual yeah. and it's some of it is so intuitive which is so hard for those people out there who are type a like myself do you remember like, with, yeah. when i was pregnant with aries i was I'm nauseous so you're nauseous I had yeah so with hyper, both. <laughs> i had hyperemesis gravidum how many oh. sessions did i miss none Never. And, and I never. also had you work a around. throw up bag. Yeah, never I brought that's, a, yeah, that's your work I brought, I love it. No, she I, would like gag all the time, run to the bathroom and come back. 
Oh man. No, but you did it. And I think, I think. Cause it's going to happen. You're yes. going to feel, you yeah. know, uh, again, tired. You're going to feel tired. You're, you might, ha you know, I threw up for 10 months. That was, I don't recommend that for anybody, but, uh, one or two things are going to happen. You either are going to feel terrible mm -hmm. and then lay there and create potentially more detrimental experiences mm -hmm. or feel better. you're going to show up, still do what you yep. can. Do what you can. Yeah. And, and this is in, like your body tells you. Yeah. And in totally. No, my body like, told me to take a nap. Oh, I was like, yeah. I was like, if your body yeah. was like, you're going to faint, you'd like. Yeah. No. So this down. is, this, you know, and I think in my yeah. experience, I've trained a lot of pregnant women. Yes, you have. And I've rehabbed a lot. Of, I'm not a PT. You know, I'm a personal trainer. I stay in my lane. Again, Lacey and I refer out when necessary. Mm -hmm. yeah. I highly recommend seeing a pelvic floor therapist. But I've worked with a ton of women, and I think that most women feel good when they train. Yeah. If they can get through it, again, a long, as long as you're listening to your body, if you feel faint, you stop. If you are actually going to throw up, you stop. Um, if you're bleeding, you stop. But majority of people, if you're sticking to your strength training program, not only do you actually feel better, but your recovery is so much better. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Ladies, thank you so much for coming on and spending your time and talking to me and talking to the listener about kettlebells. It's really important and also your perspectives are very valuable. Where can people find you? Well, we're all over the place. Um, <laughs> and, and by the way, I'll link everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah our are... best thing, probably social media for us. Mm -hmm. um, it's under our name. So Lacey Lazoff and Melissa Paris Fitness is at the end of her. And we try to put out a lot of content that's educational on our pages about mm -hmm. kettlebells and just things that we get questions about. So those are great places. Mm -hmm. And then we have a platform called Bells Up TV um, that I'm sure you'll link. And we have our strength training programs with digital class formats. Amazing. They follow it. And then we do a lot with education on there as well. Missy has a postpartum sort, or sorry, yeah, a postpartum, postpartum. Um, strength sort of like well, you can probably talk yeah, about it. Yeah, it's just body weight, but it teaches people sort of what I feel to be the most important movements. Um, right postpartum, so after that six-week postpartum checkup, some crawling, some rolling, strengthening that, strengthening your core, um, and a lot of breath work in there so that you're prepped for the beginner program. Love that. And we've got, I had, I just did a tutorial that was like a six video deep dive into snatching. It's always something common people cool. want to talk about. So we always have things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, we just, we love what we do. So <laughs> we're really Thank excited. You guys. Thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much for coming on. This is great. great.